There is so much to say about the Nissan GTR, it's hard to know where to start. And due to its iconic status, it's all been said before in hundreds of books, videos and features. And with the launch of the new GTR over a year ago, it has been tested, reviewed and scrutinised more than any car on the earth. Now if you're watching this, chances are you're more than familiar with the exotic car rivaling performance of the new GTR and what it can do. So we thought there was no point doing another against the clock road test. What we wanted to find out is what the new GTR is like, not from a rich Joe Blow perspective, but from a modifier's perspective. And what is the car like compared to the best of the B&R series of GTR, the R34. Now finding an R34 GTR in the US isn't easy, but we found one of the cleanest and closest to stock examples we could, thanks to JC. This R34 is stock except for a catback exhaust, Nismo shocks and springs and a Power FC to retune the car for California fuel. But then again, how many stock R34s have you seen around? Exactly. Now we also bought in another GTR owner and D-Sport staff member Wen who has a 900 horsepower R33 and D-Sport editor Rob, who has owned over 30 cars and road tested more new cars than we could ever dream of. So first up, what's the R34 like? Seems to be a little bit of lag between the lower gears or lower RPMs, but once it gets up and going, it definitely moves. One of the things I wish you know had more was a little bit more support for the lumbar. You know, although these are nice bucket seats, it doesn't provide the type of support that you expect from a race car. In stock form, it really impresses me about how how mild manner it is. It still accelerates harder than my stock 33. I've had this particular GTR now for almost three years. Uh, what I like about it so much is, number one, it's different. Not too many people have it here in the United States. Reliable, fun to drive, a little costly to hop up, but the rewards are definitely there after you fix it up properly. You can feel just how connected with the road you are. It's, this thing's a little bit stiffer than factory with the S-tune suspension, but I tell you what, it really does give a lot of good feedback to the driver. You can really tell that you're at one with the car. Turning is great. But you can still get a little bit a little bit sideways, which is good. No understeer. They really are biased a little bit more towards oversteer when you drive them nice and hard, and it really rewards you. The R34 GTR really is a pleasure to drive. I mean, it's the pinnacle of what the GTR was all about. Now, the R34 is a legend in the modified car world, and it's what the 90s and early 2000s Japanese tuning scene was all about. But with the removal of the 280 PS Gentleman's Power Restriction Agreement, Japanese car makers wanted to take on the world's best supercars in a car that was less than half the price of most. This would require a whole new type of beast. And this is the result. But now what it's all about is comparing this to the R34. It feels like that whatever you're asking the car to do, it goes through all the ECUs first. It deciphers the best way to do what you've asked it to do. While with the 34, you're telling the car how to do it. You know, you can throw it, you can chuck it, you can have some fun. I have to say that a person that likes to drive, is, uh, considers himself a driver, might get a little bit bored of the new GDR. I mean, it's fast, it does everything right, brakes are phenomenal, torque is great, everything is perfect. But you may just find it, I don't know, a, a little bit dull after a while. All right, first impressions, interior is really nice. I like the way that they double stitch the dashboard. The paddle shifter is also something you have to get used to, but I love it, I think it's great. There's gobs and gobs of torque on the low end. This is great. This car basically drives itself. 
looks wise, I don't know, it still hasn't caught on to me, but the rear end definitely looks nice to me, but the front end still has to work itself in my mind. I just wish it came in a manual six speed. That's just my preference. As far as the power delivery, it's definitely all there. The interior is nice and plush. Yeah. It feels like a luxury car. Yeah, unlike the R34, this vehicle almost has no turbo lag at all. The vehicle just pulls any gear you're in, smash the throttle, and it goes. I would definitely buy a 35 for daily driving. It's easy to drive. You don't have to worry about the car being loud. You don't have to worry about shifting gears. With the same amount of price tag, I would definitely buy the 34. Uh, main reason is, if this car is, you know, $100,000, you can definitely build a 34 to perform much better than a 35. Well, if I had a choice between a stock R35 and a, and a modified R34, I, I would definitely go with the R34 GTR. It's just, to me, it's more of a pure sports car that's gonna require some driver input, you know, and that's, that, that's why I like the challenges like that. I don't want the car to drive for me, you know? The R34 is a performance car, and the R35 is a luxury performance car. You know, the leather is nice, all the gadgetry is there, you know, everything feels comfortable. There's probably no comparison between the two vehicles. It seems like the R34 is a pure race car versus the R35 is an amazing, amazing street car that's capable of doing these astronomical track times. If I had to have one of the daily driver, it's got to be the new GDR. Absolutely faultless. But if you had to have a track car, I'd go with a 34. A, a 34 with you know six, seven hundred horsepower is a track car. You'd get out of the car with yeehaws, waving your hat around, and saying that's the best thing I've ever done. But if you drove this around the track, I reckon after ten laps, I'd be bored out of my brain.